I use the book Crucial Conversations, which I have here today, um, kind of as a guide. So it's a really great book that I'll talk about later that if you're interested in learning more, I recommend it for sure. So a little bit about me, since we're going to spend the next 90 minutes together virtually. Um, I'm an assistant director of the Illinois Leadership Center. So the department I work in is a collaboration between student affairs and academic affairs. So a unique partnership that we report 50-50 to both and something kind of interesting. Um, a little bit about me, I graduated from Indiana University with both my bachelor's and my master's degree. Uh, both were in public health. So a little bit of a different path that I took to get where I am now. I actually started out working in collegiate recreation and human resources. So um, I've been on campus for three years now. The first two years I spent at campus recreation um, as the student development coordinator. So I was the HR representative for student employees and we had 650 student employees. And so um, I did everything from hiring, payroll, training and development, but a lot of my role was uh, employee discipline for student employees. And so I've been involved in a lot of student conflict and conflict between students and supervisors. And so it's kind of a passion of mine to talk about how can we be better about these conversations. And in that role, I served more as a mediator than I was, um, you know, directly having the conflict sometimes, but I learned a lot of strategies of how we can better have those conversations with students and graduate students as well as professional staff. And then a little over a year ago, I transitioned to my role here with the Illinois Leadership Center. And so I do our curriculum design for our leadership education workshops, mostly for students on campus, undergrads and grad students. Um, but I work directly with any faculty staff groups like yourself, um, community groups. And then I'm also um, a master's of human resources and industrial relations candidate here on campus. I just started um, in the School of Labor and Employment Relations this fall, continuing to look at um, human resource development. And then personally, the picture on the far left and the bottom right are pictures of my horse and my dog. So when I'm not working, I love to spend time with both of them. I'm an animal lover. So go ahead and get started into our content. So I wanted to go ahead and show our Illinois Leadership Center philosophy um, to share with everyone. So. On the right hand side of your screen, you can see um, this model. This is our leadership model. And so the Illinois Leadership Center, we really believe in educating people on their specific personal leadership skills before we start talking about how those impact a team, interpersonal relationships, before we start talking about organization and community and society. So when we're looking at students who maybe don't have any leadership experiences, we start by educating them on competencies such as self-management and self-knowledge, um, integrity, being open to different situations, empathy, before we start looking at how they interact. And today we're going to take somewhat of the same approach. We're actually going to take an assessment to look at how we personally might deal with conflict in a professional setting before we start talking about some specific case studies that Florencia and um, some of her colleagues were so great to provide so that I could tailor this a little bit to your profession. And we recognize that conflict and difficult conversations are really hard and sometimes we shy away from them, but we think that these are important because the world needs better leaders. A short agenda for today. So this is a little bit different for me, um, this workshop. I really thrive on doing in person, I'm sure as a lot of us are seeing this semester and so virtual is something I'm still adapting to. So please feel free to still try to be um, interactive, throw questions in the chat box. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I think everyone should have the ability to ask questions and, and interact as much as possible. But hopefully you'll still get some new things regarding conflict out of today's workshop. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is what is conflict? Then we're gonna talk about a concept of needs and feelings in conflict and how um, needs that we might have and also feelings might interact with conflict and different conflict situations we might have. We'll talk about the importance of conflict, even though it's something that we all maybe want to shy away from, it is important and why. And then I'm going to introduce you to this concept of crucial conversations. This is an approach to having difficult conversations um, and kind of a toolkit to approach these. We're going to take something called the styles under stress assessment and this assessment 
is really great because it kind of tells you, um, you think of a specific situation, so maybe a professional setting or personal setting and how you manage stress and conflict. And it will really tell you a lot about yourself. This is one of my favorite assessments to do. Then we're gonna take a short break. So um, I'll give a little bit of a break and during that time is when you'll do the assessment. And also you can step away from your computer for about five minutes, um, take a little bit of a brain break. And then we're going to talk about the approach and I have a ton of great examples, like I mentioned, Florencia provided throughout so that we can break down each of the steps and apply them to things that you might see. And then at the end, I allowed some time for question and answer. So learning goals and objectives, we want you to be able to define what conflict is, understand why it's important, identify the role that needs and feelings play in conflict, define what a crucial conversation is and what its components are, and then learn how to effectively engage in a crucial conversation. So I put this kind of conflict spectrum um, up on the screen and I would love if, since we have kind of a smaller group, um, you'd be willing to put in the chat or share. When you see this spectrum, on the far left we have, keep me as far away from conflict as possible. In the middle we have, it's okay, I'll address it if I need to. And then on the right hand side, I'll address conflict head on, bring it anytime. So if you're willing to share, where are you at on this spectrum? Um, and I recognize that this might be different for you personally. So maybe your partner, you're on the right hand side of the spectrum because you're more comfortable with them. But in a professional setting, you might be, keep me as far away from conflict as possible. Let's see, keep conflict far away, far away as possible, okay. Address it if needed, just to the left. Okay, in the middle, far away. Address it if needed, far away. All right, this is what I like to see because then I'm like, this is great. We don't have a bunch of conflict experts. You're gonna get something out of this. We will address it. Maybe it's not like your favorite thing to do. All right. Claudia says, I'm at a point in my career that I almost always say, bring it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so something else that I kind of want to think about as we frame our mindset around this and we really start to think about where we're at on this spectrum is that every situation is different. So I'm going to provide some examples of conflict today. We maybe will all address them differently, but hopefully that's where we can um, learn from each other as well and see how our conflict resolution styles might differ, but in the end, you know, we're hopefully kind of trying to get to the same goal. All right, so another question, um, throw it in the chat box or unmute yourself. So why do you think that conflicts occur? So I kind of am going to use the terms conflict, difficult conversations, crucial conversations interchangeably for this. So um, why do these occur? I'm just going to, I'm going to give people some time to type. I think it's going to be probably longer answers. I would probably say power mm -hmm. struggles, power differences. Yeah. Um, some people are sharing needs that are not met, a misunderstanding, differences of opinions, differences in values. Somebody else said power. Um, another vote for differences in opinions. Um, I, I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody, different perspectives, because we are humans. <laughs> I have to say dogs have conflicts too. <laughs> uh, communication styles, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, miscommunications, new structures, differences in opinions and willingness to understand other perspectives, lack of communication, miscommunication, <laughs> different access to information, people feeling not heard or appreciated. Good. These are great. And a lot of these are getting at this needs and feelings concept that I already kind of touched on that we're going to talk about. So um, these are all great and all reasons that conflict occurs. So some of the things that I had listed were um, maybe strong emotions too. So sometimes we're in those really emotional states of anger, frustration, um, those types of strong, strong emotions can cause conflict, differing opinions, um, unwillingness to change. So I, I think somebody might have dropped that one in there too. Sometimes we perceive people uh, getting into conflicts with us because they're just unwilling to change. Um, just simple misunderstandings. So if someone said different access to information, I really liked the way that was worded. And then personality differences as well. So different communication styles. 
So then the next thing I want you to consider is, and you can share this one out loud or in the chat box, what is something that you've changed your mind about? So this can be something simple like, um, I used to hate avocados and now I love them. Because that's something personally, I did not used to like avocados, now I love them. Or um, maybe a person that you didn't necessarily like before or personal values or social policy. So um, what's something that you've changed your mind about? And if it's too personal, you don't have to share. But if you have something, you know, like a food that's not quite personal, you feel free to share that. I'm going to share it to say it's a silly example in, in the classroom. Um, I used to, when I was a graduate student, I used to believe that correcting errors was good for the students, uh, right? That, but I'm helping them, right? And I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing as a teacher. Um, and after reading a lot of research and understanding like how, how do we develop a relationship with the students and you know motivate them to communicate much more than just be correcting errors so i'm the first one to admit i had to change my views on that um some ideas that people are sharing um ideas about online education <laughs> somebody uh, says yes 100 um the change can be good the the use of textbooks <laughs> at least I don't know sure if that's gonna make sense to you but in our field uh, you know we critique our textbooks quite a bit um, being more vocal against upper level uh, I'm sorry upper college administration making decisions on language teaching and planning when they have no knowledge on the topic okay uh, grading with rubrics uh, letting all opinions have equal space in the classroom um, somebody uh, voted again for Corey's, <laughs> <laughs> Corey's uh, idea about or suggestion about changing your mind about online education. Yes. Um, somebody said I've changed my views about building community with my class online, being flexible helps. I used to be much stricter. And Muriel, I agree with you. I used to be the mm -hmm. same way, all about the rules, all about the policies. Again, yes, I'm with you. I changed my mind on that. Yeah. All right, awesome. So I think these were really good examples. Um, and I asked this question for two reasons. So one is to show that you can change your mind about things. So for those of us at the beginning who were like, keep me far away from conflict, you can change your mind about conflict and you can change your approach. So that was the one reason I put it is like, you can change your mind about this too. But also I wanted to point out that something you've changed your mind about is also a conflict. So sometimes we get in this mindset where conflict is this big scary battle where people are yelling at each other and that absolutely can be conflict, but it can be seen in a different way too. So I put that question up there um, in two ways, just to get you to think about like, that was an internal conflict. Maybe that was an external conflict when I changed my mind, but also I can change my mind about conflict. Thanks for participating. So for the purpose of this presentation, um, I'm going to define conflict as the situations in which the concerns of two people appear to be incompatible. This is from Thomas and Kilman, 2010. Um, and there is a really great conflict style assessment um, that Thomas and Kilman created that if you're interested at the end of this presentation, let me know, um, because it goes a little more in depth than the assessment that we're gonna do later. It talks about a specific style, like are you a collaborator? Are you a confronter? So that one's really great to consider as well. And conflict is this idea of dualism. So it's two opposing contrasting opinions that when we bring them together, don't mesh. And the concept of today is to figure out how we can make those dueling opinions somehow mesh without sacrificing how we feel and what we're, um, what we're passionate about. And then conflict is this interactive situation between at least two sides. So this can be individuals or groups and at least one of the sides considers something to be too important to give up to the other. So at the same time, at least one side feels that one or more of the others prevents them from fulfilling their needs or hopes. And this is a quote by Thomas Jordan. So the interesting part of this is the idea of needs and hopes that is expressed. So for today, we're gonna say needs and feelings. Um, so it's something that maybe is really silly to consider, but it is important. And I'll, at the beginning of this, when I really started to put this workshop together, I was like, needs and feelings, this is crazy. We don't need to consider this. But this is really important, even in those um, professional conflict situations that we, we are in. So 
Um, in the beginning, I talked a little bit about self-knowledge and how that's important. So we first need to look at ourselves. And this includes having an accurate sense of your personality, your interests, your strengths, and your weaknesses, and especially how those interact with conflict. So this is being able to be honest with yourself and how you deal with conflict um, and maybe what your strengths and weaknesses are when it comes to this. So I'll be the first to admit, you know, usually I'm like, yeah, conflict, bring it to me head on. But there are certain situations where I start to get really quiet and kind of back out of conflict. And, and so it's being able to recognize those things and say, okay, yeah, that's how I personally deal with it. Um, and I need to find a way to kind of move past that and interact with others better to be able to address conflict. So in talking about um, needs, we all have basic needs. And when I say that, you probably think like food, water, and shelter. But in this situation, we're thinking about needs that are less obvious, but still as important to us as humans. And we're hardwired to think this way in terms of needs. So um, things like trust, self-expression, peace, support, um, acceptance, those are things that are all really important to us, whether we want to share that, you know, we do want to feel accepted and we do want to feel supported by our colleagues and our administrators and people within our department. We do. Um, but there are also some feelings or desires that exist and they play a role in conflict as well. So we like to say um, this relationship between needs and feelings is kind of like an oil light in your car when it turns on, when your needs and your feelings aren't matching up and they're not being met, that's kind of when that oil light, that hypothetical oil light will turn on. So um, those feelings and desires can be things like appreciation. We do all want to be appreciated. Um, autonomy, status, sometimes role is really important to us. Affiliation, so feeling like we belong to something. And this is, this is something that's of particular interest to me uh, going into the human resource field is like how employees want to feel um, accepted and, and part of an organization. So now we're going to look at our first kind of case study example. So I'm going to read um, an example that Florencia provided. I'm in a supervisory role and I feel like I have to deal with unspoken expectations from peers in my department. What I mean by this is that my peers may have preconceived ideas of how others should be supervised or managed. So I might be seen as not supportive enough if I'm not micromanaging or too controlling if I'm actively involved or checking in, providing lesson plans, et cetera. So what would you see as the needs in this situation? You're the employee, need to be respected, validation, absolutely. Also, maybe autonomy. You need to feel autonomous as part of your role. Trust, absolutely. You want trust, respect, appreciation to be understood why you do things. That's a really good one. What about these feelings? So put yourself in these shoes. And this might be different for all of us. You might feel differently than me about um, these, these preconceived notions. So what are the feelings that you're experiencing? Frustration, absolutely how maybe people are looking at you, underappreciated to put so much time in and still not be good enough, undervalued, not understood. Also maybe confused. So like, why am I receiving mistreatment? I'm kind of confused. Underappreciated, yeah. So this is um, kind of a way to think about, you know, this isn't maybe a direct conflict where it's this difficult conversation between two people, but this is still a conflict and there are still needs and feelings in this situation. So I kind of want you to think about that as we approach the rest of the presentation. Any questions about this concept before I move on? All right, so I do want to take a little bit of time to talk about why this is so important. So it is beneficial to teams and maybe not teams in the concept of people within your department, but I would like to think that maybe a classroom could be seen as a team too. You want your students to feel um, safe in their classrooms and safe with their educators. So that can be seen as a hypothetical team as well. Um, so the first thing is this early problem identification. So when talking about teams or workplaces, small conflicts can shine a very bright light on 
deeper or larger problems that need to be addressed. So even small disagreements may seem like no big deal, but if they're not addressed, they may be a big deal to another person. They can fester and cause additional issues down the road. Um, and conflict can also identify practices or processes that may need to be improved or replaced. Better problem solving. So while some conflicts may not result in a solution to a larger problem, they can also help to provide this. So it's a challenge when our colleagues, our students, our TAs, et cetera, don't agree with our opinions or suggestions. And these differing viewpoints can often result in friction or outright conflict. However, if you can learn to engage in these types of conflicts in positive and constructive ways, which we're gonna do the rest of this presentation, then disagreements are not only normalized, but they can see, be seen as opportunities to improve um, and create ideas and maybe workable so solutions. So conflict engagement is actually an important leadership skill. It's one that's part of our competencies at the Leadership Center that we educate students on. We feel like this is something that we're not doing enough for our undergrad students at UIUC and it's something we're really hoping to implement going into the future. But engaging in these uncomfortable situations can lead to better leadership skills um, and advancement in the future. And I think something that we're probably um, seeing now is that this new virtual world that we're all part of makes conflict a lot harder, a lot more different to navigate, and a lot more awkward often. All right. And then healthy relationships, uh, morale, and commitment. So avoiding conflict can potentially harm relationships. So this can build resentment in different relationships. And by avoiding conflicts as human beings, we tend to form inaccurate assumptions about the intentions of others. And unless you actually examine them and discuss with the other person, it can undermine some of your important relationships. So to avoid creating these assumptions, it is important to engage in the conflict and clarify. So later we're gonna talk about this um, idea of a story. And sometimes what we do is create stories whenever we are not addressing a conflict with someone and we're filling in the blanks um, ourselves where we should be letting others fill in the blanks. Uh, conflict can improve productivity, so there's definitely a lot of time and energy that you have to be invested into preparing and being confident for these conversations. And sometimes it feels much easier to just say, you know what, why bother? This is just a small thing. I'm probably just overreacting, whatever, and letting it go. But it does matter. Handling conflict well will free people up to focus on their jobs rather than potential tensions, which can lead to higher productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness. So um, I think about this a lot because sometimes I work in a very, very small office and sometimes it's really easy if someone's having a bad day and they kind of make like a snide comment. We're all very close. It's not like we're getting in conflicts all the time. It will kind of bother me. And instead of just addressing it, I'll be like, can't believe Marcus said that to me. And I'll find myself stressing about that and worrying about it instead of um, going and having a conversation with him. And those types of things that um, fester and you start to think about really decrease your productivity. So I think that is important. And then personal growth and insight. So conflicts and difficult conversations can help us to learn about ourselves. It's sometimes things that we don't want to shine a bright light on. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's embarrassing. Sometimes you mess up a conflict and you're like, I should not have said that. And I didn't mean it that way. And it really requires you to be humble sometimes, but it does lead to some personal growth. Um, we're not always our best selves when we're in the middle of a heated discussion or when we're confronted with criticism of ourselves. So in each of these situations, if we're open to it, there is an opportunity for learning, which I think is really important. Um, and also you can learn about your colleagues and students in the midst of conflict. And it helps to know how they may react to certain situations and how we can use that information in the future. Any comments about why conflict's important or anything before I move on? Um, no, I think um, Jenny had a comment earlier on. <laughs> Unfortunately, we moved on, um, but she wanted to point out the importance of the word perceived, uh, right? So what we, we think that people are perceiving us some way, and it might just be that we f it feels that way, not necessarily that they are actually being critical of what we're doing. Exactly. And that's important too, like that was kind of 
the point of what why is conflict important is because we fill in the blanks and it's like that's how we're perceiving it but that's maybe not how they mean it so it is important to engage in those conversations so thanks jenny all right so now i want to get into the crucial conversations content so a lot of this is pulled from um, the Crucial Conversations book that I talked about. I really love this book. I love um, all of the content and I think there's so much more than what I can give in this presentation. So I do highly recommend it. Uh, my favorite part is at the end, it talks about some situations where it's like, how do I address these things such as when someone does become violent and um, when human resources needs to be involved. So I, I talk about those a little bit at the end, but it's a really great toolkit. So I highly recommend it. Um, so the book title fully, I think I saw Florencia drop it in the chat, but is um, Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High, and it's Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, Ron McMillan, and Al Switzer. Um, so this is one example and one approach of how to handle these types of situations. There's definitely a lot of methods out there, um, and I will say most of them have very similar advice and steps if you look at them and kind of examine them. But crucial conversations happen when there is a discussion between two or more people where we have really high stakes, opinions that vary or oppose each other, and emotions run strong. So we're going to talk about like how do you recognize when something's a crucial conversation. Um, some crucial conversations can be things like ending a relationship, addressing a friend who is making inappropriate comments about others, um, talking to someone who's not doing their part in a project or in a department, giving constructive criticism to a subordinate about their performance, um, addressing a family member who's making racist comments. These are all crucial conversations because they can have these components. So we're gonna look at our first kind of crucial conversation in action. So um, you receive an email from a student who claims that their TA was rude to them and or has disrespected them, which sometimes happens as a result of cultural differences. So this is a tricky situation because you have to hear both sides of the story. So it feels like no matter what you decide to do, someone is bound to feel like you have not backed them up. You can't just remove the TA or switch the student to another section. So opposing opinions, stakes are high and strong emotions. So what do you see as the opposing opinions here? Um, I would probably say whether there was disrespect or not, or uh, whether the comment was disrespectful or not, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, and there's also like no right or wrong answer really. So yeah, it's, you know, that someone feels like they were disrespected and someone feels like they did not disrespect the, the student. And so those are the opposing opinions. So what about the stakes being high? Stakes are high. What could that be in this situation? I would probably say like the relationship between instructor and student, right? Maybe like the student's ability to continue learning. Like what impact does it have on the learning environment? Yeah, the learning environment. Exactly. That's, that's something the stakes are really high there. Like, can the classroom continue peacefully? Will this impact other students in the classroom? Um, also, the stakes are high because the student wants to be removed from their section, but they can't be. So you're kind of stuck there. Um, and then also the student and the TA both may feel like you didn't back them up based on the decision that's made. So that's another stake that's really high. Um, students trust in the program and department. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's a lot of stakes that are high here. Um, and then emotions are strong. What are the emotions that we may be seeing here? Disrespect, yeah, someone feels disrespected. That's definitely, you're feeling that way. That's a strong emotion. Defensive, that's a very strong emotion. Angry, hurt, insecure. Embarrassment, yeah. I would also worry that we wouldn't see emotions directly. Mm -hmm. the TA could face consequences for not adhering to the code of conduct. Well, I would say what you said before, right, that the TA might feel like you're not backing them up. Mm -hmm. So maybe 
Petier not feels, you know, disrespected in a way or, or their authority not respected or that you're not trusting them, right? If you side with the student in yeah. any way. Yeah, so there's a lot going on here that makes this a crucial conversation. Um, also really awkward or uncomfortable for the student and the TA to maybe have to return to the classroom together. And so it's important you know, that we address this and handle it correctly so that um, that classroom environment is not disrupted. So yeah, this is a, a great example that Florencia provided and um, I'm doing my best to talk about it correctly, but I'm not a, a language educator. So please correct me if I say anything that's like silly. I, do, I also, I wanna clarify, I provided the examples, but these are not my own students or teas or my own experiences. <laughs> <laughs> I asked for things that clarify. did happen, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> I said, can you provide some hypothetical things? Because this we typically do for students. Um, all right, so um, now we're gonna take a little bit of a break. So this assessment does take, um, it took me about 10 to 15 minutes to really do, because it's important, I think, to actually read the questions. Um, and I want you to approach this and put on your um, language educator hat. Am I saying that right, Florencia? Is that <laughs> language educator Yes, hat? that's okay. what we are, indeed. <laughs> Put your language educator hat on and answer the questions um, in that kind of mindset. Um, so let me try to drop this in the chat box for us. So there are 33 questions, which is why it might um, take a little bit for you to do. And then take like a five minute break and we'll come back um, at 2.24. Um, so go ahead and fill that out and then keep your results up because the next thing that we'll talk about is what your results were. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. I think is everyone ready? ready? It seems like lots of people are back. We're ready, yes. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I won't ask anyone to share their results unless you really want to um, because I know that's personal and maybe you take a look at yourself and are like, oh, I can't believe that's what I got. Um, but this is maybe more to just think about how often you move towards the silent side and how often you move towards the violence. So I wanna talk a little bit about the different behaviors under each category. So under silence, um, masking can be things like understating or selectively showing your true opinion. So a lot of times we see this in sarcasm or sugarcoating and maybe saying like, yeah, that's so great, that's fine. And we don't really mean it. Um, or couching. So these are some of the more popular forms of this behavior. Avoiding, so steering completely away from the topic of sensitive subjects and not just in the way that um, we just choose not to bring it up, but maybe when there is an appropriate setting, like for me and my profession would be a staff meeting, we just decide to stay away from it, even though it's something we know we should have addressed or withdrawing, so pulling out of a conversation altogether, storming out of a room or a conversation. Um, in pandemic times, maybe just like deleting an email that you really should respond to and address, and you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna delete this and, and not answer it. So those are some of the behaviors we can see with that. And then under your violence section, we have controlling, labeling, and attacking. So controlling can be coercing others into your way of thinking. So forcing your views on others, cutting people off, changing the subject. I think this one um, could be interesting to think about in power dynamics. People have already kind of brought this up a little bit is that this controlling can be done maybe by supervisors or someone who's higher than you. Um, labeling, so putting a label on people or ideas so we can dismiss them as a general stereotype. So, um, one example would be thinking about that idea is so stupid. You have a Neanderthal way of thinking and putting a label on someone um, and then attacking. So moving from trying to win an argument to just making a person suffer. Um, and this is definitely not a good approach. Um, so it's important to understand which of these approaches we may fall victim to. So we can think of these when we're moving forward with this presentation and some of the examples of like, Am I thinking about any of these behaviors? And I think it's sometimes just a good assessment to really look at how we approach conflict. Did anyone want to share anything about their results or any comments about the assessment? 
I think power dynamics have a lot of influence, absolutely. I was just thinking as you were talking, could there be some kind of a relationship between the controlling um, part and the avoiding part? Because sometimes I think when you're trying to control the conversation or the way that it's heading, is because you're trying to avoid, right? It could be that you're Absolutely. trying to really avoid the, the bigger issue. Yeah, and I would love to say, like, I would love to talk about this aspect of the styles under stress for 90 minutes. This is something that I find really interesting, but I thought it was good to just kind of um, broach, but you don't necessarily have to, in one conversation, have like just silence behaviors or just violence behaviors. You can definitely have both and they can interact um, in interesting ways. And so it's, it's not like one or the other. It's, you can see all of these behaviors hypothetically. Um, Claudia says, I didn't have any three in my crucial conversation skills. That's okay. Um, you were supposed to still kind of think of one situation. So maybe in another situation in your life, you do have all threes um, and it's okay. It means we have room to grow. So the crucial conversations approach um, is this, I'm not going to list it all out, but this is kind of the path that we use to think about different conversations. And I'm going to go into most of the steps in depth and I will look at a step, kind of explain it. And then we're going to look at an example. And um, since this is a smaller group and people seem to be interacting, talk about how we might approach it. And like I mentioned, everyone might approach it differently. There might be some missing information. I, I did my best to kind of fill in the blanks a little bit, but there are a lot of things um, that we might think of differently, um, whether it be power dynamics or, you know, what does the student really have going on in the background? So um, try to think of it in a general sense, but throw in some ideas of other things that could be going on so we can have a good conversation around these. So start with heart. This is the first step. And this is something we've all kind of started to do. It looks like in the chat box and the discussion is thinking about ourselves um, and how we are the only people that we can control in these situations. So I can put up these examples of conversations and we might in our brain say, well, yeah, this is how the other person is going to respond. But in reality, I'm the only person that I can control. And so I can't really tell you how someone's going to respond. And we can't predict that. And that's what makes this so hard is that we can rehearse what we might say and someone's reaction might be totally off the wall from what we were predicting. So we have to try to remember that, um, that we have to focus on ourselves and then also try to remember that dialogue is so important. So that's thinking this is a two sided conversation and sometimes it's really hard to listen to what other people have to say. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Like, what if you just really don't respect what someone's saying? How can we have a dialogue? And that's perhaps the hardest part of this. Um, and then while we all would like to think that we don't have a role in every difficult situation, and sometimes we might not, it is really important to try to recognize your role in the situation, even if it might be, okay, do have a positive role in this. And um, maybe I'm not doing anything negative, but to really examine that and make sure that that's the case. Um, and after you kind of focus on those things, think about what you really want. So do you want to make sure that your classroom is a safe space and that students respect each other? I would say that's probably something we can all agree um, is a common goal. Do you want to continue a healthy relationship with this person? I'm gonna guess for the most part, we do want to continue healthy relationships. We don't go into an argument, maybe we do, um, or a difficult conversation saying like, I wanna end this relationship and not necessarily in a romantic sense, but like, I don't wanna have a relationship with this colleague anymore. I don't think that's always the intent. Um, so sometimes our motives and then the things that we want may change as we move towards this silence and violence end of the spectrum, so whenever um, adrenaline and emotions increase. So we really need to get ourselves in check when those things happen and ask, what do I really want? And then there's this concept of the sucker's choice. Um, this is what they call it in the book, which I think is always funny to say, but um, that's tricking yourself into thinking that you're choosing between two things. So this may be winning and losing, or, um, you know, I'm choosing between the TA and the student in our first example that we talked about. So 
instead of trying to focus on winning and losing or whatever your, your two choices might be, focus on this concept of and. And so this is the idea that you can have two things instead of just picking. So I want to have a candid conversation with my TA and my department about being more dependable and improving the quality of work and avoid creating bad feelings or wasting our time. So that's not, I'm going to have this conversation and then our relationship's not going to be good anymore. You can choose um, both and. So I put up an example and like I said, I did my best. So there might be some missing information, but um, let's just pretend and maybe add in things that you think would be important. So your department chair and other administrators within your unit are resisting some changes you have made in your program, particularly in terms of your pedagogical, pedagogical approach and assessment. You feel like you're being micromanaged, micromanaged by people who don't really have an understanding of language pedagogy, which is extremely frustrating. How do you approach the department chair and administrators? I think a lot of people are relating a lot to this situation right now. So we're thinking in terms of just what we talked about with the start with heart, controlling yourself and the concept of and. How would you approach this? And you don't have to have like a rehearsed script, maybe just like general things like what are the two things that in your head in the beginning you think you're choosing between? Their approach and your approach. Mm -hmm. So it's one or the other. I think going back to what you said earlier in terms of like continuing the relationship, right? Mm -hmm that we're not going in there to say it's my way or the highway, right? It's not what we shouldn't approach it as I only know, and I don't want to, I don't want anything to do with you. Like, I don't want to hear from you again, right? It's not, we're not approaching it that way or we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And um, Alicia said, we both have a common goal. We want the best for our students, right? So we would like to, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and say, like, they want the best for the students. Um, you may feel like you're choosing between what's right for the students and what's wrong, or freedom and control. So I just put up a potential response. Like I said, I am not the expert. So um, I started with, I can't control how they respond to my changes. So, so that I cannot control that. I want to maintain this professional relationship and respectfully explain my decisions and understanding of language pedagogy. So sometimes it is important to, um, I don't want to use the word defend yourself because I feel like that kind of has a connotation of arguing, but explaining and providing context is really important, um, which makes me an expert in this area. And this is not a win-lose situation. So that's just thinking about it from this step of, of start with heart. This isn't like, how are we going to go ahead and have this conversation? It's kind of how we are looking at it first. Any comments on that? I know this is probably <laughs> ask their thoughts first. What are you seeing that you disagree with? Yeah, understanding some context. Um, I would aim to understand them first because this would help me to shape my arguments in a constructive way. I like that. I'd like transparency on both sides. Is it a budget issue or values issue? So yeah, like I said, there's a ton of stuff that I did not fill in the blanks. Um, I feel like I can come across as criticism if I say I have expertise. It's like saying they don't. Yeah, that's true. Um, and what happens if the strategy doesn't work? So we're going to keep talking about this. This is just kind of the, the first step um, of how- I would like to share that what my, the strategy doesn't work for me typically with instructors or colleagues who teach in my program and not so much with the higher administration like deans or chairs so to me the the lack of resolution is typically more horizontal not so much when there's a hierarchy they push and resist change way more than chairs for example okay. that is my experience yeah 
I think, I mean, I think it, it varies, right? <laughs> and it also varies on the type of resistance that we're thinking about, right? Uh, but it, no, it's a good point, Muriel, in the sense that those kinds of conflicts could happen horizontally, right? It could happen with fellow, with peers, right? Um, and sometimes it is more of a higher up um, issue. Um, but anyway, I, I do like, I mean, some people are, I think what uh, Claudia is getting to is maybe like the listening first, um, as opposed to being so reactive at first, which we all do, right? It's just human to want to respond, but maybe the listening first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being willing and the, like, this is something that I think is is really hard for everyone is that you maybe really don't respect what someone is saying or don't agree with it. And the hardest part is to say like, okay, I do have to listen. And you, no matter how hard it is to try to have that dialogue, right? The two people um, and to try to find that common ground sometimes. So it's, it's definitely not easy. This is not like an approach where it's like step one, step two, step three. And it's this magic wand that solves all of the crucial conversations. It's some way to think about it and hopefully start to work towards some more productive conversations. Can I share uh, an anecdote that actually I had a conversation with my chair that is perfect, oh, exactly along these lines um, late last week. Um, she wasn't expressing, she was expressing what some faculty may think um, and it really helped me, it empowered me to see what other faculty may be thinking. So the idea was that she's like, well, you know, we're an older generation and we didn't get trained in, in teaching. We didn't study SLA. We don't know these things, but we did teach and with success. And so we just assume, well, I did this way and it was fine, right? So why do I need the curriculum to be X, Y, or Z? So it was really interesting to me um, to hear that they don't necessarily think that anything's wrong and therefore they're not open to change. So that was empowering to me to hear her perspective or what other faculty may be thinking because it gives me insight into how to approach differently perhaps. So I just wanted to share that because I literally just had this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next part. So this is um, learning to look, and I think this is kind of uh, oh, another way to phrase this is to take ourselves out of a, a difficult conversation that we're in or a conflict or a crucial conversation and recognize when you're in a crucial conversation. So sometimes they're not these planned, like I'm gonna go have a meeting with so-and-so and sit down and talk about this. So um, sometimes it's really easy to get caught up and have this sort of out-of-body experience and not realize when these things are happening. So. Um, learn to know when there are high stakes, opposing opinions, and strong emotions. So being able to notice those physical signs. So a lot of people, when they're in these conversations, especially if you don't like conflict, maybe your stomach tightens, your eyes dry up, and this is what signifies it for you. Um, and then emotions. So what are the emotions that you're experiencing? Are you fearful of this conflict? Are you angered? Are you sad? Are you having anxiety? So these can be a sign as well that you're in the situation. Um, behavioral, so when you're in these conversations, what do you do? Some people bite their nails. Do you raise your voice? Do you point your fingers? Do you become completely quiet um, and kind of refuse to participate? Um, and it's important to look for safety problems. And what I mean by this is not someone's about to get physically violent. Well, that is also important. This is more, is this a safe time to have this conversation? Um, are you moving to those silence and violence behaviors? Is the other person moving to those silence and violence behaviors? So we either shut down or we go into overdrive basically. So you have to know when it's safe enough to have the conversation. And while it is um, important and sometimes the best to have them in the moment, sometimes it is important to take a step back and try to revisit the conversation later. So I think that's important to think about in these conversations. So if you notice that a situation is becoming unsafe, like I mentioned, one um, example um, is to take a break, set up another time to have the conversation. Um, but sometimes you need to have it then. So how do we, how do we make this safe? So um, when emotions get really high and the silence or the violence behaviors become high, it might be time to come back later. But another question is to ask um, mutual purpose 
and mutual respect are those at risk. So um, that mutual respect where you're a colleague, you want to maintain the relationship, is that at risk or um, is your mutual purpose of making the classroom setting safe for, for students, is that at risk? Are you or the other party not respecting each other? Are you on the wrong track and not focusing on the mutual purpose? Is it time to take a break? Um, can you learn to respect someone that you don't respect? The next example that I'm going to show in a second is a really good example of this. And I struggled with looking at this example because like, well, no, I, I probably couldn't learn to respect that person. Um, how can I possibly learn to work with someone who I don't respect their opinions? Um, it, it boils down to working hard enough to find a small sliver of common ground to be um, successful. So the other thing is to apologize when appropriate. And so this one is, is really hard. Um, we all like to think like, I don't have any fault in this conversation. And sometimes you might not. So that's why it says when appropriate. So if you need to step out of a conversation, examine, you know, is there something I need to apologize for and do so when appropriate? Um, is this always the case? No. And then finally, contrast to fix misunderstanding. So always start with what you don't intend to do and then explain what you do intend to do. So um, I'm not trying to change your mind on this topic. Um, this maybe is like a political conversation, but I do want to make sure that our relationship can move forward in a healthy way and that we can still have conversations about X, Y, Z. So I put an example of this contrasting statement at the bottom, but like ignore that for a second. I just want to talk about this example. So it's 2016 and you have been noticing some problematic and concerning behavior with a student in your Spanish class saying things like build the wall and making other passive aggressive comments. You notice other students in the class are uncomfortable and know you need to address this. Is it worth it to say something? What if the student just gets angry and things get out of control? Will addressing it just give the student more attention and make it worse? And you don't agree with the student's views at all. Can you learn to respect someone that you don't respect? Any thoughts on this? I put the contrasting statement of, I don't intend to try to change your political views. That was really hard for me to write, um, but I do wanna make sure that our classroom is a safe space for others and that this is a comfortable environment for learning. Thoughts on this? I have a thought if I could share. Yeah. Um, this was something that very similar happened in one of my classes and it caused a shift in my thinking where I felt that my classroom needed to be a space for everyone to express their opinions, but there are certain opinions like these where they are, it's, it's bigotry. And mm -hmm. when bigotry is expressed in your classroom, you need to shut it down immediately because you are the voice of authority in that classroom. And so it absolutely would be appropriate to, in that moment, say, we are not going to express things like that in this classroom. We can talk outside in the hall if you like, but I need you to stop that behavior because they know what they're doing wrong there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely addressing things like that. So I thought it was interesting, you know, like, well, if I address them, is it just going to give them more attention? Um, those types of things. So I think it is important to approach it in the right way, but this is something that's really hard because this maybe is not your viewpoint. And so, um, you know, this isn't maybe more like trying to find common ground for them might be like, yeah, I want my peers in my classroom and my classmates to have a good experience. And so that might be your common ground of getting them to realize, you know, like this behavior is making someone uncomfortable, but there are conversations where it's really hard because you just don't respect what the person is saying. And, and those are the hardest to have, I think. I think also, uh, depending on your institution, you may be able to, um, refer back to the student code of conduct. Um, and sometimes when you refer to a document, I find that the student tends to take it less personal, right? That, that you know, it's not that you don't like them in class. Um, but I do understand how hard it is to, tell them <laughs> to treat them with respect when their common is bigotry, right? Or racism, and it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that it's very difficult for TAs, especially international TAs, to identify certain comments as bigotry. They are um, 
maybe not in tune with a lot of things, especially if it's their first year. And so to take action and to be firm might be easier for us as LPDs or as experienced instructors, but not so much for TAs. And it's, it's hard, at least for me, it has been hard to share um, tools or strategies for them to apply um, because it's re- I don't know where to start. We have to teach them how to identify these things first. So it's, it's kind of like a never ending job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going because I know we're having really good conversation, but I'll make sure I get to mostly everything. Um, so another thing is I've talked about this concept of a story is mastering my story. So um, retracing your path when you might be experiencing behaviors like um, withdrawing or attacking someone. Um, so take yourself out of the situations and ask yourself things like, am I in some form of silence or violence? So, you know, taking ownership of what we're doing personally, what emotions might be causing me to ask, to act this way? Um, and then what story is creating these emotions? So what I mean by this is it's really easy to think of a scenario where, you know, someone is criticizing or you're perceiving them to be criticizing something that you're teaching. Um, you know, well, they just don't like me or they just, they don't like what I'm teaching because X, Y, Z. So you're filling in those stories without getting their opinion. So um, asking yourself, like, what evidence do I have to support this story that I'm creating? So, um, you know, I've been really guilty of this as a supervisor of student employees and I have students who were consistently late or missed shifts and I'm a rule follower, like I'm HR. So I'm like, this is the rule you show up on time to work. Um, and I'm started to fill in the blanks of myself of like, it's just, they're being lazy. They don't care about their job. And then I had to check myself and my story to ensure that I was allowing them to tell their own story as well. Um, you know, am I pretending to not notice my role in the problem? So was I clear as a supervisor about the expectations that I had of them being on time? Um, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person do this? And so I think this is really hard because sometimes we maybe aren't dealing with reasonable, rational, and decent people. Um, in many cases, that might be the case, but for the most part, try to approach it as like, why would someone who's reasonable do this? Um, what do I really want from the situation? Do I really want to win or do I want to continue a positive relationship with this person? And then what would I do right now if I really wanted these results? So I want to share another example. Um, and again, just kind of created a story, but I would love for other perspectives or ideas of things that maybe I'm missing to be thrown in. So you receive an email from a university administrator, so maybe a dean who claims that they are getting student complaints about how you do things. They are concluding that your approach is invalid, even though they aren't in your field. You are so furious and you know the complaints aren't valid, so you fire back an email defending yourself. Later, you reread the email and question your approach a bit. Were you too harsh in your response? You know you're right, so you chalk it up to just defending yourself. Also, this administrator is just out to get you, so it was well-deserved. Any thoughts? I mean, I don't know how <laughs> appropriate the answer is, but the fire back an email defending yourself, I would probably give it a day. I may write something like <laughs> Microsoft Word, no chance that I'll hit send accidentally to just get my own thoughts out, give it time, come back, reread. I feel like it's one of those things where you can quickly say something that you regret later on. But again, I score very high on silence and avoidance, so I might not be the best one to answer this. Yeah, I mean, don't write an email when you're upset. I see a couple of people saying that, absolutely. Um, never answer on the spot, take time. And you absolutely could be doing everything right. Um, the how you do things, like it could, it could still be right and that email can still make you furious. And so um, I threw some things in there like, 
this administrator is just out to get you. And so it's like, how do you, how do you know that? What are the, the facts that you have seen that are, are telling you, you know, like this administrator is out to get me. Is that true? Have you asked them that? Have you had a conversation? So I just, I wanted to put something in there um, that shows where, you know, we could take some responsibility in this situation as hard as that is to think about. Um, well, I think also somebody shared something like ask um, somebody, ask a second, second person to read my email. And beyond reading the email, sometimes just discussing the situation itself, or I might go to my immediate supervisor or department head. So maybe somebody lower than the dean, right? Somebody in the middle mm -hmm. um, to hear me out and or to understand the situation and see what they how they view it because they might view it in a way that I'm not viewing it because I'm so inside of it right that I'm only seeing it through my own eyes. I also do what Florencia just suggested and in the meantime while I take one or two days I also try to gather as much information before I respond so if the TA is involved I contact the TA to hear their side of the story um, so gather ammunition if you will to <laughs> to respond. And so that also helps a little bit in cooling down. Yeah, absolutely. And like facts are really important because, you know, facts are, are what they are. They're facts and the stories are what we're filling in. And so the more that you can um, gather some facts to kind of back up your story, the better, I think. So I think that's really important. I want to keep moving. This is, you all have been really great. So I'm um, running out of time here. Okay. So this is, the actual approach that they recommend for crucial conversations is called state my path. So it stands for share your facts, which we've talked a little bit about, tell your story, ask for others paths, talk tentatively and encourage testing. So like I've said, the facts are exactly what really happened. You take the emotions out of that. Tell your story. And this is when you get the chance to tell your story, not what the other story might be. So how did those facts make you feel? How did the situation make you feel? Um, utilizing those con contrasting statements, I don't intend to, but what I do intend is um, ask for others' paths. So invite them to share their facts and their stories. Um, talk tentatively. So these are saying things like, in my opinion, instead of the fact is, and so if you can see the difference there, you know, this is my opinion versus the fact is, that's like you're trying to say, well, this is how it is. Um, other things of like, I don't think you're intending this, but you're kind of de-arming um, or it's starting to look like. So um, another thing to avoid is things like, well, I know this is probably not true or call me crazy, but um, those statements are um, less confident and shows that you're maybe not as confident in your facts and your feelings. And then encourage testing. So this is the hardest part is being open to opposing ideas. Um, and this is how we can speak persuasively and not abrasively. So an example of this, um, and I can go back to the, the state technique if you need me to, but I would love to open this up to everyone. So you supervise a full-time colleague with more seniority who doesn't seem open to changing how they teach or who doesn't agree with how you think languages should be taught. So um, for example, we're trying to be more communicative, but they still think grammar drills are necessary. Um, I'll be honest, I have no idea what that means. So hopefully someone can help me understand. Uh, oh, there, there are a lot of fun. Grammar drills are tons of fun. Okay. Um, you tried to broach the subject with them, but every time it seems like they shut down and so you've just decided maybe I shouldn't say anything. Any thoughts on this? Some people are saying they've been in that situation. It feels familiar. Um, in this particular situation with the colleague, how would you utilize, like, what are the facts? How would you tell your story? How would you ask? them for their opinion and encourage testing. So I'll share what I came up with. Um, and I'm sorry, the font is small. Um, so share your facts. I've noticed that we have some differing opinions on teaching styles and how languages should be taught. In my style, I'm trying to be more communicative. And I also noticed that you still think grammar drills are necessary. 
I care about students being able to learn in the best way possible. I feel like you're being resistant to my ideas and approaches, but I could be wrong. And I was wondering if you could share your viewpoint with me. My approach is based on current research practices, but I still want to hear from you knowing that you have been in this field a long time. What am I missing here? How can we move forward to make the best experience possible for our students? So again, I'm not a language educator, so I probably butchered some of the um, verbiage, but that's maybe how just looking at this without any other information, without any prior knowledge of different um, experiences, this is maybe how I would approach it. Any thoughts on that? Clarifying how it aligns with student success and how being aligned with colleagues helps students move as they move through the sequence. I love that. Find common ground. Yeah, I think the, the, the common objectives, right? So going back to objectives and sometimes seeing results, right? I think the, the, that tends to at least help. If they see that you're open, then they might be more open. And then when they see that, okay, yeah, I can see that. I can see that students can do this now. It's just like baby steps. Good. I have a hard time with this one. Their resistance is so hard that I don't know how to start. And that's exactly, you know, every situation is different and you have to um, have to keep trying to work. And, and not every situation is like cookie cutter easy. I, I realized that it was just kind of a way to start thinking about it. How about me? How might we start having these conversations? And I know we're running out of time, so I want to make sure I leave time for Q&A. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is this, but what about part? And I think this is really important because I recognize there are so many different situations where um, having a, a conversation with a supervisor can be really difficult. And maybe you do have a supervisor who um, will hold these things against you. And so I think that's important to recognize, you know, like what are my resources in this type of situation? Um, you know, I encourage you to try to get to this relationship where you can have those conversations, but I realize this isn't a one size fits all where you might be in a situation where you can do that. Um, differing political ideas and radical opinions, those are really hard. Um, and sometimes it's one of those situations where you need to take a break. Um, people who just won't change, like there really are those people. But again, I think it's important to approach it as, you know, why would a reasonable human being do this? Why would they feel this way? And still try to find that common ground if you can. And it might take more than one conversation. And then times when human resources needs to be involved. So there are definitely those situations. So, you know, make sure that you're understanding your campus policies and when human resources would need to be involved in things, um, in, in conversations, and particularly in mediation, which is something that, um, you know, between student employees, I saw a lot where it was like, this doesn't need to happen between a supervisor and student employee anymore. We need to, to find a mediator. Um, but for the most part, you know, like if you can have the conversation yourself, try to do so. So those are situations where this maybe wouldn't apply to, um, you know, the power dynamics, those radical ideas, people who won't change in times when human resources needs to be involved. All right, so final thoughts and any questions. Um, everyone was really great. I realize it's almost three o'clock, so I want to allow um, comments if you have them or questions. I'm not the conflict expert, but hopefully I, I helped give you some ideas to think about it a little differently. Um, Erica says, a colleague of mine gave me this advice. Choose your battles, use your energy for the crucial ones. That's great advice. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me today. This was- Thank um, you, Cherise. Thank you so much. I think you gave us a lot to think about. I think we're all reflecting on our own styles. Um, seeing things as stories, Corey com commented on that. That's really good. And perhaps we had not thought of that. Um, so thank you so very, very much uh, for helping us and uh, for incorporating our scenarios. That was very helpful. I love when I did um, this kind of same presentation for vet med earlier in the summer. And I love when people provide relevant examples because otherwise I just make stuff up that is probably so incorrect. So it's really interesting to learn about 
other fields as well. And um, ironically, I'm in the union where everyone would have been today. So hopefully my window in my office is really nice. You've got like, a picture of the campus a little bit. <laughs> we can pretend that we're all there in, a, in, a, in one of the ballrooms at the union, right? Yes. Yeah, there were some really noisy students out the window a little bit ago. So hopefully no one heard them, but. <laughs> oh, we're good. Thank you so much. So thank you.